Hello, everyone. I'm JVL here with my colleague at the Bulwark, A.B. Stoddard, and everything is terrible. A.B., today was the day over the weekend out there in resistance world. People were getting all like, ooh, tingly about, oh, what property are they going to seize first? Is Letitia James going to go after a uh, Bedminster or maybe Mar-a-Lago? And, you know, how will they change the locks? And I wrote in the middle of last week, <laughs> you people out there better settle down because ain't no Trump properties ever getting seized. What's going to happen is that the courts are going to back down and reduce his bond amount to something that he is willing to pay. And lo and behold, here we are. It is March 25th. And this morning, the appellate court, a five judge panel, of the appellate court in New York said, yeah, I mean, half a billion is so much. Would you be willing to pay $175 million as a bond? Would that be okay, Mr. Trump, sir? And they said it with tears in their eyes. A.B., with tears in their eyes, the judges said, sir, sir, would it be okay if you only posted a $175 million bond? And he said, yes, justice is done. Yeah. Happy America Day, A.B. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Trump gets excused and we get Trump and a broken country. That's what we get every single time. He's that kid in my class growing up that no matter how many times she raised her hand, she always got excused. And then the rest of us, if we had to go to the bathroom, were lying. Um, no, it's exactly what you said. JBL is always right. And he has never held to account. And he rubbed it in our faces by saying he agreed with the appeal decision and he was honored to pay that. And mm. uh, like you point out, maybe a week from now or 10 days from now when it's due, it'll just be down to 175,000. Who knows? Or but good luck will continue. Or a cup of coffee and a signed copy of the art of the deal. <laughs> um, maybe a Trump steak, throw in a Trump steak <laughs> while he's at it. Uh, and free tuition for one semester to Trump university. University. <laughs> Yeah. Why not? Uh, so there's so much going on in here, uh, A.B., the, the first of which is that, again, the clock resets. We get another 10 days that he has to come up with this money, which, again, is what he agrees to. But most importantly is that Trump immediately used this as evidence not that the court system is bending over backwards to try to help him out because they're very concerned about the prospect of a presidential nominee looking like he's persecuted but but he used it he claims that this is evidence of how rigged the terribly corrupt judge was against him because if if he was really guilty and really did owe 454 million dollars then the appellate court never would have reduced the size of his bond and so it's it's self-defeating right and this this act of mercy meant to look like the court system is trying to bend over backwards to be fair to Trump is then used by Trump as evidence of its corruption. And you know what? On that, he's right. He's right. Yes, the rod is deep. No, I, I, I agree that he can always turn anything that happens into a reason that it wasn't legitimate and it wasn't credible and it's not appropriate. Uh, and he... Just listening to him to tell us in the year of our Lord 2024 that he, this was money that he had earmarked in his personal yeah. wealth, JBL, to pay for his box. campaign. He, sure. They're coming after it because he was going to spend it on his campaign, which, of course, he always does. It's, I mean, at a, you, you could laugh till you cry. You could cry till you laughed. It's so completely insane. Um, but people believe it. And these are Biden trials and Biden cases. And he's out there branding that today and pretending that anything that happens in civil cases in New York are connected to the federal government and on and on. And he gets a platform every time he comes in and out of the courthouse. He has to get a bank of cameras. We have to listen to this crap. And he gets to bellow. It's part of it. He obviously believes it's effective. It's why he chooses to be in court on days when he's not asked to be in court, pretends that the court is keeping him from the campaign trail when he's only put in one, two, or three appearances since Super Tuesday, maximum. So it's all BS, but people love it. 
Trump show. He loves it. They love it. Let me give you one more, one more little, just you know, a report from the future because I just hopped out of my time machine. If this appeals process results in a judgment, a verdict uh, adjustment, if they adjust the the verdict down one dollar from four hundred fifty four million. If they if they say well, we're going to make it four hundred fifty three million nine hundred thousand because we think that last hundred thousand was was really questionable, uh, Trump will then claim total exoneration. So everybody should just be prepared for this. Right. Uh, it is entirely possible that an appeals court will uh, adjust the verdict down, and when that happens, he will say it's total exoneration and more evidence of the rigged, weaponized justice system. They call it justice. But we don't like it very much, do we? Right? That's that's coming. And the other thing that's coming, as you wrote today, AB, is that uh, the campaign's going to pay for all this. Yeah. Right? Can you can you t- can I just put a quarter in the machine on the the coming RNC? Yeah. Picking up the tab for everything because this is Trump's move. Trump's move is always again. He's a real estate guy, and the first rule of real estate is OPM: other people's, other money. people's money. Nobody builds anything in real estate with their own money. So in order to, to center us on this conversation, I do have to um, go to the, um, I don't know if you've memorized it, but I did quote it in my, in my piece today because the RNC is now a wholly owned subsidiary. It was mm. compromised deeply between 2016 and 2024 uh, before the new management came in, which is the family. Laura Trump, the daughter-in-law who's never run a campaign in her life, knows nothing about a state party from a national party, from a local party. And then, of course, this other guy that they brought in from North Carolina who's an election denier. So when he brings, when he gets rid of Rana, McDaniel brings in his own people. They promise that these rumors about paying for legal fees, of course, are just that. It's it's, it's a manufactured And begins with with Lara going off the reservation early, early when she's, it's announced that she's going to be taking over the job and saying, oh, yeah, you know, Republicans would be super happy if the RNC paid for his legal fees. And that's when everybody else around were like, shh, don't say that out loud. This is They shut her happen. right down. Yeah. They shut her right down and they said, no, no, this is, this is not happening. This is total BS. It's all going to be paid for by his personal wealth, his leadership packs, and a GoFundMe that the supporters started. And it's going to be great. It's going to be totally above board. And within what a couple of weeks, it was discovered that the money is going, any RNC money is going straight first. Now, some of it can end up, if it comes in a huge amount, a massive mega donor event, some of it can still be circuited to the party on down the ballot, state parties, down ballot candidates, races, et cetera. But it's first going to the Trump campaign and the, the legal packs. I mean, the leadership packs that are explicitly allowed to pay his legal bills. That's where the money goes first. Sure. And of course, there was a there was an uproar over this because actually there wasn't one at all because everyone rolls <laughs> over and knows not only this was always coming, but they're going to ask for more. GVL, they're going to ask for more. They're going to change the formulas and the percentages for paying legal fees and Melania's hairstylist, God knows what they're going to do. And you know what the members of RNC are going to do? They're going to take it. They're going to love it because yeah, this is a mob family and this is an autocracy and this is what they're getting. And the RNC from now on is going to pay for Trump's urges. It's not going to, whether he wins or loses, this is only the start. And to quote Jonathan Last from five years ago, almost five years ago, which I put at the bottom of the column, when he wrote a famous piece called Trump is Forever that will live in infamy and always be true, he wrote there will be no life after Trump because Trump is going to be the head boss of Republican politics for the rest of his days. Trump is not a caretaker of the Republican Party. He is the owner. And when you wrote that, it was true. That was before the coup and January 6th. He is going to take their money and they're going to love it. If he wins, they're going to pretend there's going to be a primary in four years. Can you imagine? Like an actual yeah. primary with like the party of tomorrow. <laughs> sure. It's going to be 
a complete bullshit. And then maybe John Jr. is the candidate or maybe Trump stays, but the money's going to keep coming. No one's going to ask where it's going. It's going to go to the family. It's going to keep everybody happy. They're going to have parties. They're going to take vacations. Yeah. And this, this is, is it. This is so the my thinking behind that that piece when I wrote it, because I, I remember it clear as day. <laughs> was that Trump is marked by two things which are structurally different in his relationship with the Republican Party. The first was he had almost no legislative agenda. Uh, you know, like the tax cuts got tax cuts got done, but really Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell dragged him into that. He didn't care about that. He didn't spend any time negotiating about that, negotiating about that. Uh, and once you don't want to pass any legislation as president, then what is your power for? Four, right? You, 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 if your power is, if a normal president is there to use that power to uh, force people who don't want to vote for their legislation to vote for it. Once you no longer to have care about passing legislation, what is your power for? And what probably what Trump always did was he made his first fight always about the Republican Party. His primary antagonists have always been other Republicans. You know, he, he like pays some lip service to how bad Nancy Pelosi is or how crooked Joe Biden or crooked Hillary are. But the people he hates most are all Republicans. So all of his energy and all of his power <laughs> was spent keeping people like Ron DeSantis in line, right? Keeping people like Nikki Haley in line, making sure that Jeff Flake got kicked out and, you know, had no place to, to, to hang his hat. And so once you see that, you realize, oh, this guy's only interest was maintaining control over the party. This has never happened before, at least in modern American politics. And you see that once that happens, once you have a party leader who only cares about that, it's incredibly hard to dislodge them, right? <laughs> Especially if the, like, if the voters, if the party voters also don't care about legislation, which, haha, <laughs> spoiler, they don't care about legislation. Not remotely. Yeah. Uh, okay, so this is this is actually a nice little segue over to the other thing that I I have been really hot about. Uh, NBC News hiring Rana McDaniel for three hundred thousand dollars a year to be a contributor to NBC News, which is amazing. Uh, I have a lot of thoughts about this because this is. This is both not a new thing. This has been happening in politics and TV broadcast journalism as long as I've been alive. Uh, but it is possibly the worst example of it ever. And so MSNBC and NBC went into semi-open revolt against management about this, uh, culminating with Chuck Todd going on Meet the Press immediately following Rana. So Rana shows up on Meet the Press for an interview which was booked with her just as a guest, not as a paid analyst. Uh, but then she shows up and she's a paid analyst. Kristen Welker kind of, you know, gamely tries to say, well, do you believe the election was stolen? And Rana changes her tune on all this stuff. It's like, oh, come on. I was just saying stuff because it was my job. Uh, at which point Chuck Todd then comes on after Rana has, has left the table. Sebastian, why don't you play that for us? Look, let me deal with the elephant in the room. Yeah. I think our bosses owe you an apology for putting you in this situation because I don't know what to believe. She is now a paid contributor by NBC News. So I have no idea whether any answer she gave to you was because she didn't want to mess up her contract. Mm -hmm. um, she wants us to believe that she was speaking for the RNC when the RNC was paying for her. So she has, she has credibility issues that she still has to deal with. Yeah. Is she speaking for herself or is she speaking on behalf of who's paying her? Once at the RNC, she did say that, hey, I'm speaking for the party. I get that. That's part of the job. So what about here? I, I will say this. I think your interview uh, did a good job of exposing, I think, many of the contradictions. And look, there's a reason why there's a lot of journalists at NBC News uncomfortable with this, because many of our professional dealings with the RNC over the last six years have been met with gaslighting, mm. have been met with character assassination. So it is, it, you know... That's where you begin here. And so um, when NBC made the decision to give her NBC News' credibility, you got to ask yourself, what does she bring NBC News? And when we make deals like this, and I've been at this company a long time, 
You're doing it for access. Yeah. You're just doing it for access. Hey. Bada bing. AB, before I start ranting like a crazy person, what are your thoughts there? Um, it's so... You know, we have to start by saying what you and I have said a few times, which is like, God, do we not want to talk about the media? We don't want to do this. Hate we knew it. the media would be put to the test and we knew it would likely fail. Watching the CNN town hall last May, where he had the audience laughing about the woman that he sexually assaulted, um, interrupting, rolling over Caitlin Collins, who's an able interviewer and an able anchor and moderator. She was in such a bad situation. He just rolled out the lies and the crap. It was so, it was such a disaster. And it was to win for Trump. And CNN had to do it right. They had to both sides it and yeah. legitimize him. And he's going to be, he's leading the race for the, to, for the nomination. And now he's the nominee. And also it's not only that they want to do that. Um, and Kristen Walker has interviewed him and had some rough spots herself. It's that they won't even put into context for Americans right now what Trump is even running on. So they won't talk about what he's saying at his rallies, sounding like the old man at the end of the bar, but what he's threatening. You know, what does it look like to provoke protests intentionally so that you can put tanks in the street, right? What, what does it look like to send the military into small towns to round up migrants? Like, what is it, what does Project 2025 mean? Like, they, we, they are so pretending this is just a normal another day. And you can get Ryan Priebus to come on your set and say, you know, Trump, what he means is, and Republican base voters want this and that. But when you get someone who was involved in a fake electric bot, an attack on this country that was going to throw us into a crisis we've never been in before, we have no idea how we would get out of. She's so guilty and so complicit. And then everyone should listen to what happened in that interview and read what she has said in the past about January 6th and about Biden's win. It's so repulsive that, well, sometimes you got to lie for this paycheck sometimes. And, and Chuck ably pointed that out. But this is this is beyond the beyond, JVL, that NBC thought this was going to be OK. And it's a lot of money. And now I'm going to shut up. But it is enraging. Yeah, it's I mean, I'll tell you why NBC thought it was going to be OK. And it's because Chuck Todd. So I, I like Chuck Todd personally a very great deal. Uh, professionally, I just have a fundamental disagreement with the way he ran Meet the Press. Um, and that disagreement was that Chuck would have people on his air who he knew weren't telling the truth and who he knew were, were doing kabuki theater. And this is, I, I want to read to you from a, a piece from Politico out today trying to explain what happened. Uh, this, this is Politico. These on-air protests may be a seminal moment in political media as news organizations continue to grapple with how to responsibly represent voices from the Trump right on their screens and in their pages without handing their platforms over to election deniers or bad faith actors. That's it. That's it right there. They're desperate to find the good Trump supporter. And the problem is there aren't really any. I mean, that's not true. There, there may be a handful of people here and there. But this is I have had this conversation with uh, editorial page people at the biggest and most important papers in America who have said, you know, who should we get? We really need somebody who can like, you know do the Trump thing for us, but we want somebody who doesn't lie. And I, I, I say, so the fact that you can't think of somebody like that should tell you something, right? I mean, it's, if, it's, it's not hard to find somebody who likes Joe Biden, who is a reasonably straight shooter, and will also tell you the 15 things Joe Biden did wrong. Like that, that those people, in fact, if anything, it's hard to find somebody who's going to come on and say that Joe Biden's doing a really good job. That's that's harder to do. Like there's me and there's Jill Biden and that's about it. And uh, this this thing that they've been doing since Trump. Right. I don't know if you remember this, A.B., but they basically had a casting call in 20 late 2015, early 2016, trying to find 
anybody who was willing to go on TV to defend Donald Trump. And this is where all the old guard conservatives lost their TV contracts or got shuffled off. Got guys like Jeffrey Lord and Kaylin McEnany coming in and Molly Hemingway because they were just like, shit, if you'll put me on TV, I'll say anything. And so that's that's what we got. I know. My God, like I know this happens. Like I was I was part of the conversation where Brett Baer was like, oh, who can we find to bring on Fox? You know, like this is. But all of it. All of it stems from the corruption of broadcast news at the start. And the, the corruption is this, right? This is Corey Lewandowski. I don't know if you remember this. Corey Lewandowski, CNN gave him a contract, A.B., after he left the Trump campaign. Oh, yes. He had signed a non-disparagement agreement with the Trump family on his way out the door. And CNN handed him money to come on air and analyze Trump in a way which he was contractually prohibited from doing. And the answer is because, as, as Chuck said, it's all about access and it's about the media's own perceived navel-gazing bullshit of, well, do we feel like we're being fair? We have to do both sides. You don't have to do both sides. You don't. NBC News. You don't have to do both sides. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. There is nobody in MAGA land who saw Ron McDaniel on, on Meet the Press and was like, well, well, shit, Brandine, we got to give that NBC News of another chance. Look at what they just did there with good old Rana. No, that didn't happen. I know. I this is you. All you have to do is tell the truth. Ah, I feel like an insane person yelling at uh, the moon. But all yeah. you have to do is tell the truth. And you know what? If you want to bring on people from politics... To, to analyze things, that's fine. Here's the one rule. The one rule. Don't give your air to people who bullshit. Yeah. That's all. That's that's it. You know why David Axelrod and Joe Trippi are really good political analysts? Because they don't bullshit. Like, they come on the air. And, like, I don't know. If you want to get smart about politics, go listen to Joe Trippi. Joe Trippi isn't selling you any lines about how great the Democrat is doing and blah, 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 you know. Like, Joe Trippi has the things that he wants in life, but Joe Trippi doesn't lie to people. David Axelrod doesn't lie to people. Mike Murphy from, you know, who's a, used to be on NBC News all the time, is a Republican guy. Mike Murphy doesn't doesn't lie and bullshit to people. And this is, this is Mike McCurry, who was uh, Bill Clinton's, mm -hmm. I think he was his first press secretary, right, and was beloved by the press. And the reason he was beloved is because McCurry never fucking lied to anybody. He was on his own side, and he was on Bill Clinton's side, and he was there to do a job for Bill Clinton. But he wouldn't lie for him. And my, I'm sorry. I'm just yelling now, and I promise no, I'll let I, you talk I, again. I, my, my old friend and mentor, Terry Eastland, who passed away last year, Terry Eastland had been the press secretary for the Attorney General Ed Meese during the Reagan administration. Uh, and Terry got fired by Ed Meese because – Terry wouldn't lie for him. Now, Terry was vigorously defending Ed Meese and was defending him both on the merits and on processes. But but what Terry said was, uh, you know, my job in working for the government is I am there to serve the attorney general and also to serve the American people. And I can, I can only do the first of those jobs to the extent it doesn't require me to lie because then that would be me not serving well the second part of the jobs. That's it. That's it. Just have. And if you get somebody who lies on your air, don't ever book them again. There. I just, Kristen Welker, I just solved it for you. Let alone offer more than a quarter of a million dollars to someone who you know has lied so many times and is complicit. Yes. Um, it, it, it's just, look, what you're describing, there's a difference, right? You could get. I can take spin. I can take spin, right? You can get the guy on to rant about the border, the border, whatever they want to do to bust on Biden and try to puff up Trump. That's different, right? On a panel than, and the, and the anchor can say, but listen, Harry, I just asked you this question. This is the third time you keep spinning on the, you know, I mean, but spin is different than lying. And Ron Fournier is a retired journalist, absolutely amazing national journal, plenty of other 
reputable publications. Um, lo- Associated Press, I think, is where he started. Long, long time journalist in Washington who retired a few years ago. And he wrote this weekend about Rana and this. He said, I try to be fair. I try to do both sides. And he said, there's no both sides to the truth. And there's yeah. no both sides to the truth. And that's that's right. We're going to keep it right there. We're just going to keep it right there. So in trying to handle this year, you 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 should even tell the audience, you know, this guy right here um, who's going to spin you at the border, he's the only person that we could find to talk about the Trump voter or the Trump agenda um, who wasn't going to come on here with a past record of telling falsehoods. On, on and air. if he lies, we're going to fact check him and after the fact him, yeah. with, a, with a video package and he'll never be on this air again. Yeah, it's just it. it's so people just um, it's it's such a responsibility that the media holds. Right. That the viewers just you can't ask them to understand what's going on. You, they're coming. They're turning the station onto NBC News to meet the press. And um, the, the the idea that this is even worth the risk, you know, that, that they paid that they took a gamble on something like this. I'm so glad it blew up in their face because it's oh, really yeah. instructive for people to read about this and, and understand it. But it's, um, it just speaks so much to the challenge that we face the rest of the year across the entire media uh, landscape. It's just going to be Here's- so hard for people to, to put this in context for Americans that this moment is different, that this moment is not normal, that we are in a five alarm fire and we have to, we can't, both sides the truth let me throw something at you if i if i was jake tapper or i were i were Kristen welker or somebody who had a had a a show and i need a panel of people to spar and debate about stuff one way to keep people honest would be to have somebody on from the left and somebody from the right and tell them like high school debate style that they have to take the each other's position yeah. So make me give you like the best arguments for Donald Trump and make, you know, Bodie McBoat face give give you the best arguments for for Biden, because yeah. then at least you can be sure that they wouldn't be lying about it. Right. 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 That's a wonderful idea. Yeah. There we go. That's I just solved cable news right here. <laughs> in this little YouTube show. Amazing. Uh, Honestly, I, this whole thing makes me so mad. And. I would I would say print doesn't have it, but it does. Ross Douthat has a job. Ross Douthat's employment is honestly no different than Ronald McDaniel, except that he's dumber. And also the omission, right, that we talk about with the New York Times, like the it, what they're doing in their in their act of omission. You know, the, the downplaying of Mike Pence saying he can't back Donald Trump. I mean, this what, what they don't highlight, what they don't spotlight, uh, is is critical. It, 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 whether it's the war in Gaza, whether it's the 2024 election, it's Biden's age, ah, you know, it, it, it the, their editorial, their, their decisions that they make about where something is placed, how um, mm. many column inches, and then, and then whether or not they talk about something at all is, is so critical right now. And it just makes me bonkers. Did you, uh, did you remember that Ross wrote himself a column about how actually Nikki Haley was much more dangerous than Donald Trump uh, a couple months uh, back. Do you remember? And the New York Times published that. It's the craziest fucking thing I've ever heard. You tell me that is is less crazy than hiring Ronna McDaniel to to give you fair and balanced, straight analysis. The whole thing's insane. This is the last thing I'll say on this. I promise the last thing I'll say. The extent to which these narcissistic broadcast outlets and places like the New York Times make these decisions based on perceive like self perception rather than service to the audience yes. is shocking to me. Because like giving Ross Douth that or putting Ronna McDaniel on, that doesn't do anything to make your audience smarter. You're not serving the people who who are there because they are they are saying with their time or their money. I believe that your your publication or your your news outlet is going to provide value to me and help me understand the world better. You're actually doing the opposite. You're impairing their ability to accurately assess reality. Yeah, and exactly. you're doing it not because of anything having to do with them, not even for anything having to do with ratings. If you want ratings, just get Beyonce on or something, right? Bring, bring Taylor Swift on. If all you want is ratings, you could do that. It's all because 
they think about themselves as these indispensable outlets and how they're positioning themselves in their field. And I, it's one more, it's like with the, you know, it's like with the, with the Trump posting bond, right? Frank Luntz over the weekend said that, you know, oh, the, the court system can't possibly seize any of his assets because if they did, that would be, you know, people would people would then vote for Trump. They would be handing the election to Trump. It's the same thing with the media. It's just like, well, we can't possibly just just actually say what we think and only present people who we think are smart and, you know, and capable. We can't do We, we got to do these other five bank shot kabuki things to to make sure that we ourselves are positioned. It's very similar to Republican electeds, right, because their job is to lead to tell their voters, this is a serious problem. I would like to regulate AI, or I would like to stem the the crisis at the border with Jim Langford's legislation. So I'm going to support it. And we are gonna lead the, re- the free world no matter what you saw in Breitbart or Gateway Pundit. So we're going to defend Ukraine. That's their job, but their job to them is to just keep getting elected to protect their own right. like careers. Right. So they're not doing their job. The job of NBC is to inform Americans in the most critical election of their lifetime, not misinform them. And but they're thinking, like you say, of like how they're perceived and, uh, you know, how they'll continue to get advertisers and I don't know, look, look position <sighs> themselves against other cables or whatever they're, it, it, you know, is factoring into their minds. But they're not thinking of the mission, which is to inform us. And this is the same thing with Republican electeds. In the age of Trump, their job has never been to do their job. It's to go along with their head down, be corrupted so that they can stay in their jobs and not get death threats. Good luck, America.